Have you ever had that nightmare where all of your plants die? After investing your time, your money, and your love into these plants, I think in, as a plant parent, we probably all just had that weird like nightmare or daydream. And we have this underlying fear. It's very real. We invest a lot into our plants, and this fear can actually be exacerbated around times where we go on vacation and times that we travel when we have to leave our wonderful plant babies behind to go experience the world. Travel, the thing that should excite us, right? Usually, travel is associated with reuniting with loved ones. It's an opportunity to see the world, experience new cultures, and most importantly, it's an opportunity to see plants in other areas of the world, other landscapes, plants that grow in different climates, right? That exciting opportunity of travel should not be a source of stress, although my friends, I know it is for us. I've been there. I've heard from you. So today, as we approach the holiday season, I'm dedicating an episode entirely to how to not kill our plants when we leave the house because plant friends it might be simpler than you think and you might be stressing about nothing so let's dive in welcome back to bloom and grow radio plant friends i hope you've had beautifully planty weeks it's so fun going through fall here in the catskills I've been seeing these green, lush plants turn yellow, now brown, and fall for me feels magical. I'm a Gilmore Girls gal. I love the fall. Feeling fall around me also is just making me take pause to see what I should personally be experiencing. And I'm feeling so called to like rest, go a little dormant, experience senescence, And fall is just that beautiful reminder. So if you're not in an area that is experiencing fall, I've been posting about it a lot on my Instagram. So if you need a a quick fall hit of of seeing the leaves change and and feeling all the feels as it feels like the your surroundings almost like go up in flames with the colors that we see, uh, you can go check out what I've been sharing on socials. Before we dive into this episode, I want to say welcome to our newest members of the Garden Party. For If you don't know, I host the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's called the Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app. It's available for both iOS and Android, and it's filled with members of our community who want to make new plant friends, propagate their knowledge together, and grow more joy in their lives. So welcome to Emily J, Savannah O, Zoe S, Amy B, and Erin H. Welcome, 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 ladies. So happy to have you and can't wait for you to get growing within the platform. If you're interested in a free trial to test the platform out and see if it might be right for you, you can check the show notes. Also, happy November. We are in November and we're running a special with the book. So I wrote a book this summer. Well, I I published a book this summer called Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness and Plants. It's a self-help book, a self-care book about how to use plants to cultivate more joy in your life. And we're running a special for the holidays that's called Give the Gift of Growing Joy. Basically, this holiday, I would love it if you gifted the book to your friends because this book is really all about finding connection reuniting with yourself, using plants to have a happier life. And they're really simple practices. Many of you have read it. Thank you so much for the support with your reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. But basically, we want to spread the love. So if you gift your friends Growing Joy, you order the book on your own. You're going to fill out a form that's linked in the show notes, and I will send you a signed book plate, which is basically a sticker. I will personalize it to whoever you're gifting. Uh, You can also do this for yourself if you want me to sign and personalize a book for you. And with that signed book plate, I will send a free month membership to the Garden Party platform for whoever is the recipient of that gift. So not only will you be gifting them the book, it'll be a signed book, and they'll get a a free month to the Garden Party platform. So I think that's a great gift. And if you want to, if you have a plant person in your life that you want to really spoil, you could do the book and a plant. Or you could do the book and one of the amazing products all of our sponsors offer, you know, like Modern Sprout has all the planty accessories or a Lomi or something like that. The book would make a perfect addition to whatever kind of care package you're building. And if you're a plant shop and you order 10 books, I will gift you, the owner of the plant shop, a year membership to the Garden Party platform. We have a plantrepreneur group where you can connect with other plantrepreneurs, just as my thank you for supporting the book. 
Okay. Now, I'm so excited to do this episode. This is going to be a solo episode. I have traveled enough. I was a professional traveler (laughs) for a while as I used to be a musical theater performer and I was constantly on the road with shows. Traveling with plants can be so scary and there's so much anxiety that I feel in our community of, oh my God, I'm going on a vacation for a week. I don't know what to do with my plants. I don't want them to die. And I have so much insight for you. So we're going to dive into the nitty gritty of what to do, how to set your plants up for success so that you can go on vacation for a long weekend, a week, or even two weeks. Billy and I are leaving for three weeks. By the time this episode airs, Billy and I will be in Florida. I'm leaving my plants for a month and I'm going to be using these strategies so that when I come home, my plants are okay. And it's a solo episode. It's just me. So without further ado, I'm so excited to tell you all the things that I've learned over my seven years of having plants. First off, let's acknowledge the fear that comes with this situation, right? Travel should bring us joy. Travel should not bring us fear. And I totally get that this can be really stressful. So high level, let's talk about some high level things before we get into the nitty gritty of real practical tips that you can do to to make sure your plants are, are happy and healthy when you return. Realistically, if you are traveling for a long weekend, you know, if you're like me, if you're millennial aged, it feels like every other weekend I'm going to a different wedding somewhere, right? If you're leaving for, you know, two to five days, your plants are going to be fine. I would argue you don't really need to do anything with your plants. Give them a great water right before you leave and go live your life. Don't worry. Come back. You'll be fine. It's when you're leaving for like over nine days. When I have travel that lasts longer than a week, that's when I start implementing the practices that we're going to talk about today. So I just wanted to zoom out for a minute to say I totally understand and appreciate your fear. I know it can be scary to leave these plant babies that we have routines with and that, you know, we're used to caring for and seeing every day, but you're going to be fine and your plants are likely going to be fine. I know I've shared this on my socials before, but I just think it's so funny when, especially when I was in the beginning of my plant parenthood, I would leave for, you know, a week vacation. I would group all my plants. I would water them. I would do the wick method. We'll talk about all of this in in this episode. And I would come back. I would be so stressed about my plants while I was gone. I'd be thinking about them. I'd be scared that they were all dying. I come back. All the plants have bloomed. The peperomia have thrown off inflorescence. The tropical plants have all grown new leaves. It's like they, to spite me almost, it's like they're, it's like them saying, we don't need you, Maria, relax, right? So this is me telling you to relax if you're under, if you're traveling under a week and you have general kind of more hardy tropical plants, you're probably going to be fine. And this also comes to understanding your plant collection. So as we know, I'm obsessed with plant parent personalities. If you don't know your personality by now, you can go take the free test that I have on my website. It's linked in the show notes. But I think that having a successful plant collection that brings you joy, that lives for you, that you don't live for, you've got to understand your lifestyle and then pick the right plants for your lifestyle. So if you are someone who travels a lot, you're going to be choosing low light, hardy, drought tolerant plants that can kind of withstand some neglect when you're out and about. If you're a mindful plant parent and you want those high moisture plants because you want to be engaging with them every day, that's where we're going to need more maintenance when we're traveling. But it's really important to understand what kind of collection you're working with. I'm going to give a whole bunch of suggestions. Not all of these suggestions are going to apply to every person's plant collection because it's very different. You know, the low-key plant parent, the plant parent that has mostly snake plants and ZZ plants, hardy, drought-tolerant plants, you're probably not going to need to do a lot of the stuff that we talk about in today's episode if you don't want to. If you want to, you're welcome to. And, you know, if you are a mindful plant parent that has a home full of alocasia and uh, maiden hair ferns, my kind of disclaimer, high level disclaimer of you're probably going to be okay. You might need to be a little bit more wary about that because obviously your plants are going to need some more maintenance. So just kind of saying with this episode, pick and choose what resonates with you. I'm going to throw a lot up against the figurative wall for you and use what works. And please let me know on socials what you end up implementing. And as we talk through, I'll let you know what I implemented for this four week I think it's three weeks or four weeks in total that I'm going to be in Florida away from my plants. 
thank you, thank you, thank you to Lo Me, my new favorite kitchen appliance, countertop kitchen appliance, for sponsoring today's episode. Plan friends, I hope you've seen my somewhat viral video that happened a couple of weeks ago on social media where I showed my mom, Mama Faella, my Lo Me. She's so funny, and this video went kind of viral. So if you're curious to see what I'm talking about in this ad, definitely go check it out on my Instagram. My Lo Me is my new tabletop composter. It's mine and Billy's favorite new toy. You know you're an adult when your favorite toy is a composter. That's an insane thing to say. But if composting is something that's been a pain point for you, something that you really want to start exploring, but you don't want to be saving your scraps in the freezer to take it to a farmer's market, or you're not in a position where you can have a, a home composting system in a yard, if you're in an apartment... The Lomi is the answer to your prayers, my plant friends. It takes your food scraps, eggshells, coffee filters, Lomi approved plastics and cardboard and turns it into dirt. I kid you not, dirt. Okay, so what is it and how does it work? It's a sleek countertop composter. It's white. It's very modern looking that can reduce your garbage footprint by up to 50%. You literally take your food scraps from the day. Last night when we ran our Lomi, we had eggshells, a bunch of coffee filters and coffee grounds, a bunch of peels from a soup that we made, and some dead house plants <laughs> in it. You load it up, you press a button, and in a few hours, the Lomi magically transforms your food scraps into dirt that you can use in your house plants, garden, garbage bin, green bin, or in my case, we dump it outside in our forest. I cannot say enough wonderful things about the Lomi plant, friends. I was really skeptical about it at first. I requested double the amount of time to test it than I normally do for sponsored products because it just seemed too good to be true. But I can tell you after using this thing for more than three months, we've probably run it like 60 times. It delivers every freaking time. It's amazing. And Billy and I have probably reduced our trips to the dump. We don't have a garbage system where we live, so we have to go to the dump to take our garbage. And I would say we've probably reduced our trips. We used to go twice a week, and now we go once a week. And our garbage doesn't smell because all the stuff that's smelling in our garbage is now going into the Lomi. You've got to see it for yourself. They never offer coupon codes, and Lomi offered a coupon code to our audience for $50 off. It's a total investment. $50 off goes a long way with code BLOOM at checkout. So go to Pella.Earth slash BLOOM. Pella is P-E-L-A. Pella.Earth slash BLOOM and use code BLOOM for 50% off your Lomi and let me know what you're turning into dirt at your own home. travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, so let's go over what I think is the big three that you have to understand with traveling. We're going to talk about what you need to understand is happening and then how you respond to it in these big three, right? Light, airflow, and water. So let's start with light. Now, because you're a listener of Bloom and Grow Radio, I'm sure that your plants are very smartly put in exactly the right lighting you know, situation that they need. And kudos to you. I'm so proud of you. If they aren't and if you need support, we have a free Understanding Natural Light download that you're welcome to use if that would help you. But this is where you just kind of need to understand when you're leaving and what's going to be happening to your plants from a light perspective while you're gone. So as we know, light is the most crucial thing that plants need. Plants use light to make food, right? 
So plants need the light. <laughs> plants need the light. No no light, no plants. No light equals dead plants. So there are a few things to take into consideration when you're leaving for more than a week that you might want to apply for your plants in order to make sure that nothing happens that is out of your control while you're, while you're gone. So first off, if this is in warm weather and you have sunny windowsills that your plants are in and you're leaving for an extended period of time, what I do personally is I take all of my plants out of my windowsills for two reasons. Number one, if they're getting exposed to more direct light, there's the potential that they might burn. But also getting a little bit less light for your plants is just going to help them transpire less and also um, not have them in, you know, hyperdrive. So generally, I take the plants out of my windowsills, especially my old sunny windowsills for my old apartment. The other thing with windowsills is if you're leaving, a lot of us, you know, when you travel for the holidays, with Billy and I, we're leaving, we left for Florida in the fall, right? It was, you know, 40s, 50s outside, our windows weren't that drafty. By the time we come back in December, it's going to be really cold. The sun is going to be setting way earlier than normal, and our windowsills get really drafty. So you have to take into consideration, is anything happening in your, you know, hometown, home environment that might affect your plants while you're gone? So if you're traveling in the winter, I would I would very much recommend removing them from windowsills so that they don't get those cold drafts and wither and, you know, get really unhappy and you can't be monitoring that, if that makes sense. Another thing that I do when I'm traveling is I have tons of grow lights in my house. Shout out to Soltech and Modern Sprout. If you follow me on social media, you know my grow light situation. I will reduce the amount of time that my grow lights are on every day because once again, I want to kind of just slow down my plants transpiration and photosynthesis process. I don't want to turn the lights off. I don't want to deprive them from light, but I also, if I can kind of slow them down a little bit, I do. For example, I have plants in my modern sprout grow house in my living room, in my bookshelf. It looks really beautiful. You can check my Instagram for the uh, bookshelf redesign that I did. But normally I have that grow house, the light on a timer for 12 hours. When I left, I reduced it to eight. So I know that the plants are getting some light, enough light to kind of get them through for the next three weeks, but they're not getting put into overdrive. Ideally, maybe they're just a little, you know, moving a little slower, getting a little sleepy to kind of preserve their energy and reduce the amount of water that I need to give them. And then when I get back, I'll bump it back up and the plants are fine, you know, if this is a three three to four week time that we're gone. Realistically too, with, with lighting in general, your plants can withstand several days of, of not being in the light. You know, they can't withstand months upon months of not being in light. But, you know, I think when you're traveling, it's better to have them in less light than in too much light. Because once again, you're not going to be there to see those leaves burning or to see your plant suffering and wilting. So those are just my rule of thumbs. I also say, I, I this is something I do advise against. And at the end of the episode, stay tuned because I'll kind of, I'll, I'll let you know a bunch of things that I've heard recommended that I don't advise. We'll go over what not to do at the end of the episode. But one of the things that I don't really recommend, you see a lot of people talking about like, move all your plants into your bathtub. If your bathroom doesn't have light, I wouldn't advise that. I'll go more into that at the end of the episode, but that's just a disclaimer. You know, make sure that realistically, you know, if you're leaving and the light out outside isn't really going to change and you're gone for a week, you're probably fine. If you're going for more than a week, I'd say pull your plants off your windowsills. If you're leaving for a time where you're you're leaving in one season and returning in another season, definitely pull them off the windowsills and monitor how long your grow lights are on. Okay, so that's light. Number two, airflow. And I'll tell you, I will call myself out and blow myself up for a very embarrassing story in this section. So airflow. You want to make sure that you don't have heat or air conditioning blasting while you leave, especially if you're leaving. Once again, this holiday season, a lot of us are leaving while it's warmer and coming back to a much more colder environment. Be mindful as we move into winter where your heaters are, okay? A lot of us style our homes uh, if you have like baseboard heating and don't realize where the radiator is or where the baseboard heater is and our plants are actually in the direct vicinity of those heaters. When those heaters kick on, 
all of a sudden that can fry our plants. That's going to be very dry air, very hot. It's not going to make our plants happy. So before you leave, if you haven't done this already, as we move into winter, we're going to have a whole separate episode on that. Mind the heating, figure out where the heating is and make sure that your plants aren't directly next to it. I would also say the same for air conditioning. When you're gone, you want your plants to just be experiencing the same kind of internal indoor conditions that that go on normally. Example for me and Billy traveling to Florida for four for four weeks. Once again, we're leaving when it's warm out. We're going to be returning when it's cold. Oil is really expensive right now, so we've decided that you know we're leaving our heater on to I believe. 60 degrees, your plants can, you know, can handle it. They're not going to be thrilled, but your plants can handle 60 degrees. But we're making sure that we're not leaving the heat off for the four weeks that we leave, because if we left the heat off, our house might go freezing. I mean, our house could have freezing conditions, which isn't good for our pipes anyway, but our plants don't want to freeze. So make sure that if you're leaving for an extended period of time, your plants are still going to be comfortable. And if you're leaving in extreme conditions, make sure that you're taking that into consideration. I have to tell this one story. The first year I was a plant parent, it was the summer. I had gotten a bunch of houseplants and Billy and I left for a week. I think we went camping or something. We left. It ended up being the hottest week in New York City. I believe our house, our apartment, and we were on the fourth floor of an apartment In New York City, you don't have central air, so you have to turn your air conditioners on. And we left our air conditioners off when we left because we didn't want to waste electricity. Well, we came home and our plants were barely surviving because they were so hot. I think our internal home, our home temperature probably raised beyond 100 degrees because I think it was like 95 degrees in New York City that week. And my sweet pothos, I say that my pothos is like, my lesson plan. It's taught me so much, but this pothos has been through so many dumb plant parent newbie mistakes that I've made. And it was completely wilted. So many of the leaves like turned yellow and brown. I mean, it was so mad at me. All of my plants were so miserable because we just cooked them for a week. So, you know, you might, if you're leaving when you're going to experience some extreme conditions outdoors, if it's heat or if it's cold, you might want to just figure out some sort of baseline or have a friend come and turn your AC on you know, just to cool your house down one day because my poor plants were not happy. That plant really suffered. It's still with me. I still have it, but I think there was a intense resuscitation period after being gone. But in general, you know, aiming to keep your home between 60 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, I think is fair. You don't need to keep them super warm. Plants plants can withstand a little bit of cold, but just be mindful of that because that's definitely something when I was a beginner plant parent, I did not think about. Um, I totally didn't, didn't think about, you know, how the, the home temperature would change when we left. Cause normally we would just turn everything off because we don't want to spend the energy or the money on oil. But now that we've got plant babies, can't do that. Okay. The third big one, before we dive into little smaller hacks and tricks and what not to do is watering. Okay. Let's talk about watering. Cause I think watering people get really freaked out about. We can keep it simple. Okay. If you're leaving just for a week, once again, if you're leaving for an extended, you know, a long weekend or a week, depending on your plants, this is, you know, obviously not the case if you have allocation, a lot of ferns that need, you know, watering every couple of days. But if you've got the majority of our tropical plants, our raphidophora, monstera, you know, snake plants, hoya, your plants will probably be fine if you just give everybody a really good drink before you leave. And then they'll slowly dry out. I mean, I realistically water my plants once a week, if not once every two weeks, right? Because I have a lot of those hardier plants. So make sure that everybody gets a good drink before you leave and then be prepared for when you get back to give them a good drink when, when you get back. If you're leaving for more than one week, this is when we need to start getting into quote unquote watering hacks or making a plan to make sure that your plants get enough water to survive while you're gone. So here are a couple of options that you can go and dive into. And I've personally done all but one of these. So I can speak personally to it. And the one that I haven't done, I have a friend who does all the time. So number one, you can group your plants together. This is something that I always do when I leave for more than a week. I take the plants off of the windowsill. In this current home, I put a tarp on a very large living room table that we have. I put all the plants on the tarp. 
And basically what you're creating is a little microclimate. So in that little microclimate where all your plants are huddled together, it's going to be a little bit more humid. Ideally, because your plants are away from the windows, they're going to transpire a little bit less and they'll probably be fine. They're always so happy when I come back. You know, this is the method that I mentioned earlier that when I group them together, I come back and they're always blooming. There's always new growth and it's kind of borderline infuriating, if that makes any sense. (laughs) One disclaimer here, because when I show this on social media, I do have people write me where if you have a pest problem, you probably shouldn't group your plants together. You are taking a risk when you group your plants together that if one plant gets a bug infestation, that infestation will spread across your entire plant collection. It's a risk I take, but I have had people write me saying that they don't do that because they've had, you know, thrips, take an entire plant collection down with that strategy. Also, I would advise to do a very thorough pest inspection before you leave, because once you're gone and you can't be actively, you know, eradicating pests on a daily or weekly basis, that's when they can really take over your collection, whether or not they're grouped together. So before you leave, do a thorough check, check under the leaves, check in between the leaves, check, check the leaves, wipe down any, you know, scale or, or bugs that you see and kind of set yourself up for success there. This next tip I haven't done, but I've heard of someone in our community, Jeff, who does this. He puts humidifiers on timers. So depending on how long you're leaving, if you have plants that require higher humidity and you are worried to not have your humidifiers running while you're gone, he's got this like crazy setup, a bunch of different humidifiers that are that are on a bunch of different timers that help him stay in that, you know, 80% humidity range. You would probably need a plant sitter to come refill your humidifiers, you know, halfway through the week or or however whatever your humidifier situation is. But if you're someone who has humidifiers running all the time, you're probably someone who has plants that are going to need more maintenance and you're going to hire a plant sitter, which we'll talk about in a little bit. There are several kind of quote unquote watering hacks that you can use to keep dispersing a small amount of water to your plants while you're gone. Uh, You can either use self-watering planters that you can buy, but I I wouldn't advise, you know, buying new planters for all of your plants just for you to go on a vacation. Self-watering planters are one method, but you can also just use, I call it the string method. I feel like you, it could also be called a capillary wick, but this is like a very low, low lift kind of not fancy way that you can kind of help your plants maintain Water. So what you're going to do is you're going to get some sort of cotton wick. It could be cotton string, yarn, something like that. And you're going to cut a bunch of pieces of that string. You're going to fill a glass of water. You're going to put one end of the string in the glass of water. And then you're going to put the other string wrapped around the surface of your soil. What happens is through capillary action, that string is going to absorb water and then ideally keep your soil moist by having water in the string that's sitting on top of the soil and your soil will absorb that water. So if you have, you know, a few plants that are more high maintenance, you might be able to group them together and use the string method. I know a lot of people who use this method and, you know, it seems to work for them. Another thing that I've seen, I believe Summer Rain used to talk about it, is like the capillary water mat, watering mat, Um, where you, you know, it's basically a mat that absorbs water. You put your plants on it and they absorb the water through the drainage holes. I personally haven't used that method, but I know that that's another tried and true way of water maintenance while you're gone. One method that I thought was really interesting that a friend who gifted me a bunch of plants had was using this method. You can put damp moss, damp sphagnum moss on, or damp other moss, whatever you have, decorative moss on top of your soil to help your soil stay moist. My friend who gifted me a bunch of plants did this. So when she gifted me plants, they had moss on top of the soil when she gifted them to me. I thought the moss just looked really beautiful. It looks very natural and organic. But she said that when you water the plants, the moss gets watered as well and then will help maintain a damp soil surface. So depending once again on how long you're going, if you're maybe going for nine days, maybe going for 10 days, and you just need a little bit of extension and you don't want to hire a a plant sitter, that moss might be a fun thing for you to try. 
And there's also all sorts of self-watering spikes. I think one is called like the plant nanny, but it's those terracotta spikes. Most of the time you like fill a wine bottle with water. You put the spike at the top of the bottle and then you flip the bottle over. The terracotta spike releases, slowly releases water into the soil while you're gone. You probably have also seen those like watering orbs that are, they look like beautiful stained glass um, or blown glass. You could try one, some of those watering spikes. We'll put links to some in the show notes if you're interested. Now, if you're gone for more than two weeks, and this is the method that I now have kind of resorted to, I'm kind of over the hacks. So you can use all the things I've talked about. I've tried them all. I now just have a plant sitter. I One of my very good friends, Sarita, I trust her. She's a farmer. She understands plants. And once every 10 days when we travel for extended periods of time, I leave her my key and she comes and she waters all my plants. She will normally send me a photo of them so I can feel okay. And that's just the method that's been working the best for me. And that's what will be happening on this current vacation that I'm on. So, so you know, these are all of the different watering things that, you know, you can do. But to be transparent with you, I didn't do any of these. I did take my plants away from the windowsill because we're going to come back and it's going to be winter. I put my plants on my table. Sarita is going to come once every 10 days, give everyone a water, make sure everybody's okay and move on. And it's totally worth it to me. We will go more in depth into when and how to get a plant sitter that's right for you later on in this episode. So stay tuned. Plant friends, I'm so excited to welcome back Modern Sprout as a repeat sponsor for Blooming Grow Radio. They've been with us for years. I'm so excited to have them with us in November because if you are looking for stylish and functional plant accessories for the plant parent in your life to gift, look no further than Modern Sprout. Their products are such a needed marriage of style and function, particularly the grow lights that I've been using for years. If you've seen my social media, you know this. The Grow House, which I actually talked about earlier in today's episode, was featured recently on my Instagram in the uh, bookshelf redesign that I did. It's this gorgeous brass grow house that looks like art. It's kind of a terrarium, but it's open and it has a grow light on a timer in it. But also, if you've seen old photos of the of my old bookshelf, which I called the Grow Shelf, it's the Modern Sprout Grow Bar that I installed in my Grow Shelf. It's so easy to install, and it turned a whole shelf of my bookshelf into a highlight haven for my plants. I had blooming geraniums tumbling out of my bookshelf at all times. It was so cool. All of their lights, because they have several different super stylish models, are smart apps, and all of their grow lights which are high quality, white, beautiful, full spectrum light, are smart app enabled so you can set your own timers based on what you need in the app and assembled in the US. So I've mentioned the grow house, which is in my living room. I mentioned the grow bar, which used to be in my bookshelf, which also I'm thinking about putting under my kitchen cabinets to grow some herbs in my kitchen to get through the winter. I'm also so excited about their grow frame. I just got their landscape grow frame as part of a office gallery wall. So they're grow frames that come in different sizes are literal frames that you can mount on the wall that have grow lights in them. So you can frame your plants as living art and it looks so cute in a grow wall, maybe as a header. I've seen people install them at the head of their bed, which is really beautiful. They really have taken grow lights to the next level by incorporating them into beautiful pieces that really complement your home that are super sleek and gorgeous. Speaking of gorgeous, they have products that are made out of this brushed bronze and they have my favorite stylish watering can that's actually part of this bookshelf redesign that I did because it's just so beautiful. And I talk about this watering can all the time, and I know it's so annoying, but watering cans are a big part of our experience as a plant parent, right? And it's three liters, so it holds so much water, which allows for me to water all my plants with fewer trips to the sink to refill. And it's this gorgeous brush bronze that is so sexy. It looks like a piece of art. It's literally in styled in my bookshelf. It's got a nice, long, skinny spout. So we can go under foliage. So you're not just, you know, watering on the top of foliage and getting water everywhere. It can, it's also great for watering tiny pots. And I'm just obsessed with it. These more upscale modern sprout products would be the perfect wow gift for the holidays for the special plant parent in your life or for you. You should request a grow frame 
or a grow house for yourself. And Modern Sprout is offering our listeners 20% off with the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. So visit modernsprout.com slash growingjoy to see my top picks at every price point for plant parents or for you. (laughs) And use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout for 20% off. This offer ends on December 31st. Take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free plant parent personality test because plant friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little plant parent personality quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Okay, now we're going to get into some little specific things that I like to do before I leave that I think help with traveling and spending time away from plants and also suggestions for what not to do. (laughs) What things that I've seen promoted on the internet that I definitely do not recommend for people, especially if you're starting out. So first off, I this is a little thing, but before I leave, I like to cut off all the dead leaves um, or yellowing leaves from my plants. Now, I do this for two reasons. One, it's good to take the leaves off for like overall health. But more importantly, what I'm thinking about is when I get back. And to make sure that my plants are doing okay, I want to know if they've gotten into trouble. And a lot of the times you can tell if a plant is hurting by the state of their leaves. So by cutting off all of the dead or yellowing leaves before you leave, so basically you're leaving a plant collection that's all green foliage, all happy and healthy foliage. When I get back, if I notice that one plant has 10 yellow leaves or one plant is all brown, then that's my cue to say, okay, this is the one that's really hurting. And I know that the that you know unfortunate transformation has happened when I'm gone and something has gone awry and I need to take the next steps to fix it. So I just think that's like a simple thing to do that's going to set your return self up for success with helping your plants, if that makes sense. I know I mentioned this already, but inspect your plants for with, for pests before you leave. I have scale. Like, I cannot seem to get rid of scale in my plants. I feel like I have a couple of plants that have just had scale. <laughs> They've just had scale for years. And it's just, you know, me and the scale have, you know, a hydrogen peroxide party every couple of months. But I know that I will wipe plants down with my little scale solution, which I just do peroxide and water before I leave. So I know that when I come back, if there is more scale, if there is new pests that they've come while I've been gone and I can take action to eradicate, but you don't want to leave your plants with pests so that those pests can multiply while you're gone. And then you come home and have a violent panic attack. (laughs) Okay. So now let's talk about plant sitters. I think plant sitters are great. And I think, you know, for me, as I've grown in plant parenthood, I'm always just going to do plant sitters moving on. So there's a few things that I've learned as I've had several plant sitters that I think are important to talk about because I kind of learned the hard way. 
So number one, you know, the first thing, if you're looking for a plant sitter, the first people you obviously think to turn to are your friends. I think that's great. I personally have a friend who's my plant sitter now, Sarita, who I mentioned. Shout out, Sarita. Love you. But if you are going to go the route of choosing a friend, I would highly suggest do not ask your plant killer friend to come water your plants. If your plant killer friend is your only option to come water your plants, then you need to invite your friend over before you leave and give them a thorough walkthrough and write out instructions for exactly what they need to do. Also, if you are working with friends, I think that it's really important to absolve them of any plant death while you're gone. We in the past have had friends and neighbors water our plants and it didn't really get done or, you know, there was an issue, some plant died and if you're going that friend route, you've got to release the fact that, you know, you might have a plant death. You might have a mistake or an oopsie, right? So, you know, I might argue that it's better to not use a friend <laughs> as a plant sitter. But for a lot of us, that's what we've got to work with. So if you do, you know, ideally try and find a plant, a friend that has plants, even if they just have plants, like they know how to water plants. And if they don't, just understand that your friendship with this person is more important than your plants, usually. <laughs> Also, um, if you go the route of a friend and like you feel weird about paying them, always bring them back a gift. What I normally do with Sarita is, you know, she comes to my house. How many, based on how many times she comes to my house, I normally get her a gift certificate to like her favorite restaurant in, in our area. Or you can bring your friend back a gift from wherever you're traveling, if that makes sense. Or you can gift them with some plant cuttings of your own plants once they get back. But I would definitely say make sure that you acknowledge their service to you you know, and acknowledge your appreciation. So what do you do if you need to find a plant sitter, but you don't have friends that you want to ask, or you don't have friends that are available? I would turn to Facebook groups, but I would first turn to our garden party app. So the garden party app has a find a plant friends near me section. You can go to the member section and you turn your location on and see other people that live near you. We also have region-specific groups. So if you're in the region-specific group in our Garden Party app, you can say, hey, I'm leaving town. I need a plant sitter. Is anyone around? Meet them for coffee. See if you like them. You know, see if you trust them coming into your house. And then, you know, give them instructions and have them water your plants. Plus, you might meet a new local plant friend, (laughs) which is always nice. So I would say try and use community platforms, whether it's our app, whether it's maybe a Facebook group that you're in, or Instagram, if you have an Instagram friend that you know is local. But I would say you know, just approaching someone with that mutual passion for plants. The other thing is there's a, you scratch my back, I scratch your back kind of moment. So, you know, with Sarita, because she waters my plants all the time, like I owe her, if she's traveling and she needs a favor, you know, I'm always going to be there to help her. I have another girl who is a big Dahlia grower and, you know, she's needed me to water her plants several times. And I've texted her when I've been in crisis, like when my car broke down and I needed a quick ride to, to the train station. So I think it's also nice to make those plant friends because whoever's watering your plants who has plants is probably also going to be traveling in the future and you can return the favor, which always feels nice. I wanted to give another shout out to an app that I recently learned about. I have not used it, but I've downloaded it and I've met the founder. She seems very nice. This isn't sponsored, but um, I think it's interesting. So there's an app, there's a plant sitting app called Watering Can and you can sign up to either be a plant sitter or you can sign up to get your plants watered. And I think the watering charges start at like $45 per visit, but basically they qualify, you know, they run a background check on their plant sitters, they qualify them, and then you can go into the app and based on your location, find a plant sitter that you would just pay. Kind of like those dog walking apps, it's like a plant sitting app. So that's called Watering Can, and uh, you can, you know, look at it in the app store. Speaking of apps, I just have to give, you know, a quick plug to the app that we've created, the Bloom and Grow Garden Party. It's the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. It's available for iOS and Android. It's got those cool local uh, find plant friends near me features with local and regional groups. It's also got groups based on plant entrepreneurship, based on planty DIY, conversation threads on planty DIY, growing joy, house plants, gardening. It's just a really sweet community of really supportive plant friends that I'm really proud to be a part of. And you're welcome to come join with a free trial if you'd like. It's linked in the show notes. 
So last but not least, tips that I'm not a fan of. I wouldn't advise this. <laughs> I see it on the internet a lot and I'm like, okay, I see why you're recommending this, but I don't agree or it, this isn't something that I personally practice. I see a lot of recommendations on the internet of like, put all your plants in a bathtub and and like fill the bathtub with water and then put your plants in a bathtub. Uh, here's why I feel like that might not work for people. Maybe it does work for certain people. If you have a bathtub that has tons of bright light and I guess moisture loving plants, maybe, but most of our bathrooms don't have natural light, especially if you're living in an apartment. So don't move your plants into a no light environment. I wouldn't recommend that. Maybe if you're doing it for an extended weekend, a short period of time, that's fine. But that's just not something that I think is super effective for traveling with your plants. The other thing is I do see, you know, whether it's a bathtub or whether it's people saying like, get a big tray and fill it with water and then put your pots in it and they'll slowly water themselves. I just think you're setting yourself up for real root rot potential. Putting, you know, pots in a saucer filled with water, that soil is going to be very, very, very wet for the duration of your plant's life, time that you're gone. And that's not really what your plants are used to because you're not doing that on a daily basis with how you care for your plants. So I think that there are much more effective ways that I've mentioned in the watering section of this episode that will serve your plants better. I feel like the whole goal of how do we make sure that our plants don't die when we're not when we're traveling is just how can we make it as similar to what it's like when we're here and our plants are thriving while we're gone? And you're not sitting your plants in vats of water for an extended period of time while you're home. So don't do that while you're gone. I've also seen a quote unquote hack circulating to make like a plastic bag greenhouse for while you travel, which is basically, we've talked about it before on the podcast with Mark Hachaduri and his plant hospital. Basically, you take a plant, you put it in a plastic bag, you zip it, and then you maybe poke some holes and you create basically a terrarium or a mini greenhouse effect for that plant. I would not advise this while you leave for vacation because what can happen and what has happened to me when I've used this, this is a great way to resuscitate your plants, right? It creates a human environment. It gives your plant what it needs to kind of heal itself if you've had a lot of leaf loss or if you're, if it's going through, you know, through something. I've used this successfully to resuscitate a plant. But what has also happened when I do this is that molds can grow on your plant if it's not properly ventilated. You need to kind of open and close that bag to allow for some ventilation. If you just zip the bag closed and put your plant in it and leave for two weeks, that plant is going to have no fresh air. Molds can potentially grow and the molds can really wreak havoc on the plant. So I would say only use this method when you're home and you can monitor what's going on with the plant. Personally, I've just seen that go really wrong <laughs> with my own plants. So I would never, I, I see the way this is explained on the internet and it makes me very nervous for beginners to do it incorrectly and then kill their plant. Easy. It would much, your plant would be much happier just being out wherever it normally lives in your house. And then one other thing. Now, I know that this is something that I practice and I understand the risks and I take the risks because it works for me, okay? Also for my plant sitter, I like that all my plants are grouped together so she's not running around my house watering on my plants. But you should know as a disclaimer that if you do group your plants together, there is the potential for pests to, you know, spread across your whole plant collection. And that's why if you do do this method, please make sure to triple check for pests before you leave. And also understand, listen, like there's a risk if you leave for an extended period of time that you're going to come back to some unhappy plants or some dead plants. And friends, that's okay. Like, we should be living our lives for ourselves, <laughs> not for our plants. I give you permission to lose a plant if it is in exchange for going on some incredible adventure, reconnecting with family, seeing old friends, exploring a new area of the world, right? It's not that deep and you're not a failure. I think there's also just the prioritization of your life over your plants sometimes. And I know that as we're coming out of the pandemic, when we've all been home more, our plants were our lives, right? So now we move into this, how can we set our plants up for success, do all the things that we need to do, and then also just kind of let go and understand that it's cool. It's whatever, I've done what I can. If I lose a plant, it's okay. The world moves on, we move on, and we are better, more enriched people for those experiences that we enjoy, right? 
And I think that's kind of the thought that I want to leave us all with. I get a sense after talking with so many members of our community, we're all kind of going through it right now. We're all transitioning back into the real world. The holidays themselves can be very stressful. The holidays are not positive for a lot of people. And we're learning about how to travel again and how to be out and about after spending many of us, you know, several concentrated years in our homes with our plants. I know for me, I mean, I literally moved to the middle of the nowhere. I moved to the middle of the woods and re-emerging to be social has been stressful for me outside of my plants. And I can see how that stress could be projected onto your plants. So what I want to wrap up this episode and invite you to think about is yes, we've gone through this episode. I've given you so many different things that you can apply to your plant collections to your strategy for leaving your plants. And I hope that they work beautifully for you and I want to know what you end up implementing. I also just want to give you permission to let go and know that the plants that are waiting for you that are still alive when you return are the plants that are supposed to be in your life. And if for some reason you lose a plant or a plant gets sick or something happens to your plants while you're gone, it's okay and you will continue growing alongside whatever plants are left. You will learn lessons from that experience, and the world will keep going, right? I think it's so important for us to just remember that we've brought these plants into our lives to bring us joy, not to bring us stress. And I know that traveling can be one of the most stressful things for plant parents. And I want to just kind of absolve you and give you permission to just let it be what it's going to be. I believe in you. I want to hear what you implement. I want to hear where you're going. I want to hear where you're traveling. Billy and I are currently in Florida when this episode airs. I went to Florida for basically all of November to stay with Mama and Papa Fiella. Billy's coming down. Uh, We're spending the holiday with my family. My siblings are here. I'm so excited to be spending time with my family and also helping my mom with her plans. And I know that, you know, when I return, Sarita's taken good care of my plants when she can, visiting, you know, once every 10 days. And when I return, the plants will be what they are. And I can't wait to go back to them and take care of them throughout the winter. But I'm also excited to just have faith in the fact that I've set them up and I'm just not really thinking about them that much while I'm gone, which is something silly to say, but something very important because it's a point of growth for me because I know that traveling used to really stress me out with my plants. And I hope that this episode might help you on your journey for continuing to cultivate joy with your relationship with plants. So, you know, there's also all of this information in a blog, which we've linked in the show notes of this episode in case you want to go back, maybe use a checklist, maybe kind of you know, highlight stuff so you remember to do it when you're traveling for your vacations. I wish you the safest travels. I wish you so much joy. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. 
And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like the Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. 
In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 